thank you for joining us again today for this this webinar uh, part of our crisis communication series this is part four uh, social media management I think this is one very critical part of uh, in in our day and age today uh, this this conversation about crisis communication sometimes crises actually happen in the space of social media and um, so this should be a very interesting and valuable conversation. I think it would be awkward and strange of us um, to get started today and I, I think Kevin and Greg you will agree as yeah. we as we get started today um, to ignore probably the, <laughs> the largest news item going on uh, right now and that is um, a bit of a crisis in the world today in regards to the corona virus the COVID-19 as it has been called um, this has been designated a pandemic by the World Health Organization and it is important for us to remain uh, calm measured careful in our responses uh, but also that we are um, able to take the appropriate actions and uh, make the appropriate responses. Um, I'm not going to go into a, a big explanation of COVID-19 and what's going on around the world. I highly recommend you spend some time, if you haven't already been, been bombarded with information from the news, spend some time on the cdc.gov website or the World Health Organization website. Uh, Adventist Risk Management also has uh, information on our website at um, adventistrisk.org and I believe it's a short link actually so adventistrisk.org uh, slash COVID-19 um, where you can find information uh, about how this might relate to travel policies and some resources for local churches and and schools. Um, I want to actually take this opportunity since since I'm going to choose to look at it as an opportunity um, to, to actually hand this over to Kevin and Greg for a moment to talk about the opportunity that a crisis in the world like this represents from a communication standpoint. We just want to spend a few moments on that. Um, Kevin and Greg, mm -hmm. if you could speak to that. Sure. Yeah, thank, thank you, Dave. And, um, you know, Kevin and I were looking at the um, ARM website this morning and uh, actually appreciated the comprehensive suite of uh, content and useful information that you all have posted. So from a communication standpoint, um, you know, it's actually very timely and topical that we're here today to talk about social media in the context of issues and crisis management, because as Dave noted, we're certainly in one right now, and it's uh, obviously not one of our own creation. So in the, we're here to talk about social media. We're going to talk about social media, but we also, as Dave pointed out, we know that uh, COVID-19 uh, and the impact to your organization um, is definitely top of mind for many of you. So these are not unrelated. They're very closely linked, and we'll try to um, sprinkle in uh, some of that flavoring throughout our conversation here today. But, you know, a key, I mean, what, what this actually does, unfortunately, is remind us of a key message we've been delivering uh, throughout this webinar series, and that is the vital importance of planning in advance. So from a business continuity and from a communication, crisis communications and issues management standpoint, we hope you've had the opportunity to, you know, carefully consider some of the counsel we've been providing and begin, you know, at least doing some of this thinking and planning ahead of time. But the reality is here we are um, right in the midst of a very serious and accelerating and unpredictable situation. And so many of you are having to think about how to navigate through this from a communication standpoint, right? So you have to be thinking about the informational needs of your stakeholders, both external and internal understanding the anxiety that these folks may be feeling and you know going back to our topic for today social media is obviously one of those very vital information conduits that you have to share important 
and obviously accurate um, information with your stakeholders. So again, very timely topic. We're going to talk through how to use social media in this context, but of course, there are channels beyond that that you need to consider. Uh, you have employees who may be used to hearing from you over email or in face-to-face -face meetings. Um, you know, Kevin and I kind of chuckle. It's not really funny, of course, but you know, in a situation, in any other type of crisis, you might want to think about a town hall meeting, right? Getting all of the employees into a conference room with leadership so they can hear uh, information in real time. But that sort of goes exactly against a lot of the counsel we're getting from uh, medical and scientific professionals, which is, okay, social distancing, the hand washing. Let's you know, let's reduce you know the number of heads in a room and you know help help reduce the risk of this. So it's really just important to understand the nature of this from a medical and scientific standpoint to think through the impact on the organization. Um, what is the operational impact? Are you going to be having um, people working from home and, you know, maybe people who are coming in on public transportation are handled one, you know, so there's a lot to think through. And if you haven't really sort of had a chance to sit down and do that, we would certainly encourage you to do that right away as the situation continues to evolve. So think through your strategy, think through your messaging, you know, think through the linkages uh, to business continuity and, um, you know, also, you know, just also bear in mind the strengths and weaknesses of all your communication channels. So social media, but also your website, newsletters, emails, just any and all channels, and then start mapping out um, how you're going to help, you know, navigate your way and help your stakeholders navigate their way through this. Kevin, anything quick to add before we begin? Absolutely. In the early days of the internet, the nickname of, of the internet was the information superhighway. And I think information is key. The social media, through the use of the internet, you're able to gather information, you're able to analyze information, and then you're able to distribute information. And if you, you think of it in those terms, that'll help you through this situation when you're uh, and what you're going to do as, uh, as information becomes available, as you need to understand what it says to you and what it does for your organization, and then figuring out where to deliver that information. Excellent. So with that, Dave, unless you uh, had anything additional, we will just go ahead and proceed. So, no, please, thank you. okay, thanks, Dave. So um, we're going to cover um, a fair amount of ground today um, is is, uh, as Dave mentioned at the top, um, social media, um, you know, it's, it's love it or hate it or somewhere in between. Um, it's both a potentially huge positive, but it also has some serious downsides, right? So, you know, with the uh, sort of evolution and in introduction evolution of social media in the last two decades or so, um, we now see issues that never would have been issues, right? 20 years ago, um, you know, in the old days, you know, you learned about a crisis sometimes when there was a reporter on the phone. Um, today, it, uh, it can bubble up right on your own Facebook page. So we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about how issues can rapidly emerge, uh, morph and evolve and sort of take on different shapes, oftentimes before they uh, begin to subside. Um, we're also going to talk about when to respond, when to leave it alone. I mean, the reality is um, there's certainly an instinct many times to respond in the heat of the moment. And oftentimes that's the exact worst thing that you can do. So we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, we'll talk about, um, you know, the role of reputation, you know, social media in protecting or certainly also when things go bad, uh, definitely damaging your reputation. So how do you stay on message? How do you develop that message? And then the importance of um, a social media policy and strategy. So, you know, it's absolutely vital not to just sit down at the keyboard and, you know, just sort of randomly um, put out content. Um, you really need to have a strategic viewpoint on how to leverage this channel uh, to the greatest benefit to the organization. So these are these are all things that we will cover today. Uh, just very, very briefly, because by now many of you have heard our song and dance, but um, Kevin and I work uh, with Kurt Lampy, and Kevin will say a few more words about the company. 
Uh, but me personally, I'm an Andrews University graduate. Um, I always love to point out that I'm Pathfinder's dad. Um, all three of my kids have been in the Hyde Park Constellations Club in Chicago, and it's been a wonderful experience. Professionally, um, as I said, Andrews University grad, public relations major. I've been mostly in large public relations agencies throughout my career, and they have been uh, collaborating, working on corporate reputation, issues management, um, working very closely uh, with Kevin and his wife, Kitty Kurth, and Kevin can share a few words now about himself. First, I'm going to learn how to unmute myself here. The um, uh, Kurth Lampy Worldwide, we're a strategic communications firm. We uh, have a simple mission statement, and it's ideas delivered. Um, we also have a corporate word, which is serendipity, um, which we look at as when good people get together, good things happen. Um, we help our clients figure out the, the best way to say something, the best messenger, and then find the best targeted audience. Um, we have um, um, worked on clients, everything from uh, Paul Recess Begina, to, who is the real life hero of Hotel Rwanda, the film Hotel Rwanda, um, and to other faith leaders. We've also worked with uh, in, in on political campaigns and have um, uh, helped nonprofits and NGOs handle difficult situations in a variety of different aspects. So we're going to jump right back into this. As we have been doing throughout um, our presentations, we uh, we like to. Uh, can you go back? Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> Got those quick fingers. Um, just wanted to share a uh, piece of advice, a piece of perspective that seems very relevant uh, to the events that are going on today. In a crisis, the only asset you have is your credibility, and you know the key takeaway there is, um, you know, even when they're we're in the heat of a moment. And even when events are swirling rapidly and out of our control, we always have to remember uh, the importance of accuracy, um, the importance of providing the right information at the right time. And ultimately, at the end of the day, as long as we can protect that credibility, uh, we've talked about sort of a goodwill bank, building a goodwill bank. And a lot of that comes from truth and veracity and accuracy and timely communications. So just keep that in mind, not only in the context of today where uh, this COVID-19 situation you know, continues to move very, very rapidly, but also in the context of issues uh, and crises that you may see bubbling up on social media. Always, you know, Kevin likes to make the point, take a deep breath, be thoughtful, be deliberate, um, and then, only then, take action and do the best you can to take the right actions. So, um, you know, nothing, nothing here is going to, uh, to surprise you, but um, I mentioned uh, strengths and weaknesses of social media. Um, and some of these cut both ways, right? So the ability to communicate with people quickly is, um, is, is certainly a key attribute of social media. I mean, you can go from thought to post within seconds, but again, that's not always the best idea. So. The fact that you can do that, I mean, it's, it's, it's an important attribute in a situation like we're in today where you may have some new information that comes out, a new guideline from the conference um, that you need to communicate broadly as, uh, to as many people as possible, as rapidly as possible. So that's good. But the downside, of course, is communicating too quickly in the heat of the moment where you know, tempers may still be running a little too hot and, you know, it may lead you to say some regretful things. So it cuts both ways. Um, information just moves rapidly and it moves widely. And once it's out there, you can't really take it back. So again, this comes from, or this speaks to the need to have your social media strategy down pat and understand the information needs of your audiences to make sure that you're sharing the right messages at the right time. So social media is everywhere. It's absolutely permanent. Um, and this last point is a key one. As most of you may already well be aware, everything that's out there, once it's up, it's gonna be archived somewhere. Um, anything can be screenshot by friend or foe and can be shared in ways that are not necessarily beneficial to your interests. So that's just something to always keep in mind before you hit post. Um, what are the pros of, of social media? Look, it's, um, it's what they call an owned 
media channel, right? So we have, um, we often think of things in the communication world as paid media, which is advertising, which is completely under your control. Uh, you can say what you want through the medium that you want, but it's going to cost you. There's earned media, which is a lot of what Kevin and I do, which is, um, you know, pitching a reporter, persuading the reporter that you have something of value to say, something that their readers would have interest in. And then you get through that third party filter, get through the journalist, persuade him or her that it is in fact a story. It appears in print or on TV or online and voila, that's why we call it earned media. You haven't actually paid for that. And then, you know, there's another owned media channel, which is social media. So, you know, it's very low cost. It's uh, right in front of you um, and you have access to it 24 seven. So it's a great way to proactively and strategically tell your story about, you know, the, the, the events and the narrative that you really want people to understand about you and all of the content that supports that ongoing story. So it's a huge, huge opportunity for you. You can tell it in your own voice. Uh, again, you're putting it out. Uh, you're putting out your own messages. Now, there is a lot of clutter on uh, the various social media platforms that we're going to discuss. But as you build that relationship and earn trust from your audiences, they will, your, your messages will filter through to them. And, you know, through frequency of uh, communication and, you know, reiterating the message so that it resonates and so that it really sticks in the minds of people. That's just a hugely beneficial aspect of social media. And also another way to stand out uh, from other non-faith-based organizations is to make sure that your values and beliefs come through um, consistently, day after day after day. So that's another huge way to stand apart from, say, secular uh, social media pages. What is your organization's preferred social media platform? So um, check um, which one is the preferred one that your organization is currently used, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok, Snapchat, all of them, or we don't use uh, social media. So everybody can, uh, can vote here. We, uh, we can poll everybody. We've got about 10 of 17. Let's see. I'm not seeing more votes coming in, so we may stop about there. Okay. What do we got? Very interesting. Um, and, and not surprising, actually. Um, Facebook is, is uh, the predominant social media in the country. Um, and, um, Instagram has taken off, um, with the ability to Instagram, you know, you can post pictures as well as video now, and there's communication going on in the background on Instagram and Twitter to, uh, to, to a less extent. Um, among our attendees today, but that's very interesting. And we're going to be in the seminar, we're going to be getting into uh, all these different uh, social media yeah, I platforms. Mean, those are certainly the big three, um, but there's other opportunities, I think, on some of the additional channels that we can touch on as we proceed. All right. And so taking a look at the current media um, and the major platforms in social media, um, we're going to take a walk through each of these and talk about their strengths and, and their weaknesses. Facebook, as we saw in our poll, was the most popular um, one that's being used and is certainly one that um, plays out um, statistically. Um, the interesting thing is um, Facebook also has become more and more an older skewed um, uh, you know, um, choice on, on social media. It's been interesting. Um, Kitty, my wife, likes to refer to it as, as um, women, women of a certain age who tend to live on Facebook. Um, and so it is very strong. But it does have its, you know, the things that you can do on Facebook that can help you. You can recruit followers. You can send out messages within the Facebook platform in order to find more people to participate. You can then track those people and you can look at their comments. And you can 
monitor the posts. You can, you know, with, with uh, monitoring a group, monitoring a page, you can add, you can delete if things are unnecessary or violate your own so, you know, social media rules. Um, one of the challenges though with uh, Facebook, as, as we've seen over the last couple of years, is fake news. Is the fact that things are being posted that just aren't true. And Facebook itself, it says, that it, it, it won't necessarily edit everything. So you need to be careful of stuff that is out there and they can spread very fast. Um, it's also the, the ability and the, the uh, opportunity to spread rumors very quickly. Uh, something can pop up on Facebook and uh, be instantly sent around the world. Um, as Mark Twain once said, you know, a, a, a lie can travel around the world before truth gets its boots on. And that can happen now instantaneously um on facebook and as i believe and i talk about this often when i talk about social media it needs an editor um everything on facebook pretty much everything is social media needs one an editor for just grammar punctuation um word usage um and just needs an editor to fix things um and sometimes it needs an editor for whether this is necessary to be posted here or not and one of the things to always remember about um, Facebook, but all social media, is that the algorithm really determines the reach. So what they're doing behind the scenes will be determining what things are being posted to your own Facebook page or, or posted within the ads as well. Taking a look at Twitter, um, it's once again a global reach. It is all around the world. Anybody can sign into Twitter and be able to read what you're saying. Um, it's easy posting. Um, it, it, it's quick, it goes up, um, and just like that, the speed of response. It has become a tool for um, opinion leaders and others who want to influence or comment on something that is happening right now. Um, you know, any, you, you can, you know, if you want to get a temperature read among self-identified people, you can, um, uh, you can do that uh, by reading Twitter feeds and looking at hashtags. Uh, one of the weaknesses is a limited number of characters. You can only say so much um, and, and people only read so much. So that first 120 characters is very important. It's not editable though after you post it. Things on Facebook, you can go back and redo it, but not on Twitter. The only thing you can do is delete it. So that first draft, just like we forgot to put the T in limited, if this was posted on uh, Twitter, that, that, that uh, missing T will stay there forever. So a little uh, subliminal um, uh, lesson for everybody there. And the, you have the challenge on Twitter of attracting uh, followers. Um, you can't go out and recruit as much. You can through, through other means, ask people to follow you. But it's not like Facebook where there is built in ways in order to develop your audience. Instagram, image based. Um, this is so important. Instagram tells a story with a picture. Um, and almost exclusively with that. Yes, there's some posting of words, but not the way it works. Um, it is continuing to grow in popularity. Um, more and more people are following others. There's been a shift in um, the younger generation and moving from um, Facebook to, to Instagram and people that, that are basically living on Instagram. But you also can use video and you can post quick videos um, as well as links to videos that can be done when you are posting them on Instagram. The weaknesses, you gotta have a picture. If you don't have a picture, you're not going to reach the people. Um, Instagram does not have yet the gravitas um, that Twitter has uh, or even Facebook. And then clearly it's, it's, it's driven by a younger demographic uh, that is doing the, the following and the commenting and living their lives on, uh, on Instagram. LinkedIn, um, is very much business focused, um, so that it tends to be people either trying to uh, uh, market their, their company or their services, but also to market themselves. Uh, people are looking for jobs or people that are looking for people to hire or people to connect with. Um, you get to control the message on LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn tends to also be, like I said, it needs an editor. LinkedIn tends to be more well-written, um, tends to be uh, more factual, um, and kind of a self-editing uh, culture exists on LinkedIn, which, which leads to its fact that it has a strong, a strong um, 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 
a, a, excuse me, a, a strong reputation. Um, one of the weaknesses is it's, it's hard to target ads and ways to reach other people if you're buying digital advertising or looking to reach people through, you know, through a traditional ad and one of the social media. Um, low audience engagement. It, it is more difficult to get people to engage on LinkedIn, um, not, not as quickly as they can engage on Facebook, but that also is rapidly changing. But then their reach is difficult to measure, you know, where you can look at look on Facebook and find out pretty quickly who's reading, who's looking. Um, that's a little bit harder to do within the LinkedIn platform. TikTok, um, stay away. Uh, <laughs> I guess that's the best way to put it. Um, it is primarily the um, where teenagers are living right now and as all social media platforms, they mature and they move to an older demographic. Mm -hmm. LinkedIn is, is tied to uh, Chinese developers that are capturing data from phones. Um, and I've included a link to a New York Times um, story about um, the, the challenge of and the risk of, uh, from a national security standpoint about, uh, about TikTok. So just avoid TikTok. Um, and, and, and don't even put it on your, uh, your phones uh, um, at all because it may, be, it may be collecting data in the background. Snapchat. This is definitely the younger demographic. It is visually orientated. It's a quick post. You know, Snapchat was, was created um, um, to, to basically serve the, the teenage and college market with quick pictures and quick invitations and pictures that could only go up for a few minutes at a time, but then disappeared. Um, so it is not necessarily, as I say in the weaknesses, uh, they've got a bad reputation. And it's, it's, you know, some businesses are using it to market their services, but it's not necessarily a good way in order to, um, um, in order to be able to reach any type of constituency. You've got a limited posting time um, with, with Snapchat and it is basically primarily a dating relationship platform. And we've got to the next uh, poll question here, which is um, what social media platform are your stakeholders using? Which of these platforms do you think that your stakeholders are, um, are using um, and how are they talking and communicating um, to each other. So we're, we're looking for you to share, you know, who, you know, you know, who your clients or your constituencies, which of the social media platforms do you think they're using? How is voting going there? The voting is up. And um, this is interesting. Um, so you, it's interesting, 20% uh, of, of the people here, and that's a significantly statistically relevant number there, the, the old po reader polls here talking, um, there is um, uh, the fact that they're using all of them is important. Um, the fact that you do recognize that some of them are using Snapchat. Um, we saw an increase in LinkedIn usage um, and a big increase in, in Instagram, but Facebook's still leading the way. Um, so we see that there's opportunities uh, for everybody to uh, use uh, social media channels as a way to communicate to their targeted audiences. So thank you yeah. very much. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for participating in that poll question. Um, so I think that um, that, you know, the results of that informal survey tie in nicely to this importance about the need to understand your audience, right? So from our first poll question where um, it was pretty exclusively Facebook, uh, Twitter, and I guess Instagram, you know, now we see that, well, there may be opportunity beyond that because we have people on LinkedIn, uh, we have people on Snapchat. So it's really important. Um, and, you know, we have a, a slide here shortly to talk about the importance of reputation. It always, always, all of this, all, everything we're talking about in this crisis communication series has to be grounded in building that positive reputation and then protecting that reputation to the full extent possible when an issue arises, when a crisis emerges, um, and just really always top of mind as you develop that social media and beyond communication strategy. So 
we understand um, that each audience uses social media differently. Um, you know, the youth in your church and in your conference are using um, social media probably in more visual ways than some of your older members, um, you know, like myself, um, that uh, still appreciate, you know, words on a page and spend more time on Facebook and LinkedIn and, and you know, even Twitter to some extent. So understanding the needs of your audience um, also can help you understand how they are likely to react to an issue that emerges on a social media platform or multiple social media uh, platforms. And that can lead you to um, more targeted and effective solutions as far as managing that issue on those different platforms because not only are you seeing you know the words on a page but you'll have a better understanding of what the concerns are um, you know if it goes beyond concern you know more you know it's something that's causing anger and severe disagreement and a lot of quarreling online you'll understand not just the words on the page, but understand maybe the concerns that are unspoken, that are underpinning all of that. So you can go beyond just responding to the words and respond to the underlying concern. So understanding, you know, sort of the demographic and psychographic profile of your audiences and how and where they are uh, processing information will ultimately help you uh, be more effective in how you manage conflict and issues on on social media so as i said instagram very popular a young younger folk um, facebook uh still um, much more popular on my older demographic um so you know keep in mind um you know the people who already follow you get to know them as well as you possibly can but also um to kevin's point some of these channels are easier to attract um, new participants and spark higher levels of engagement. Some are uh, more difficult to accomplish that. So understand, you know, the pros and cons of the of that of, of those possibilities on each channel, and then you know figure out how to how to bring them into your into your networks. And and again, that that all also goes to um, you know as we understand more people and bring more people into the fold. How do we manage our reputation and manage issues productively to keep moving forward? So, um, you know, community management is obviously, um, you know, in, in large corporations, in large organizations, um, you know, there often are teams of people focused on, you know, just keeping a close eye on all the social media channels, um, flagging, um, emerging hotspots and conversations and, um, you know, elevating, you know, they, you know, there's a whole protocol for how do you elevate to whom do you elevate on this topic versus this topic. We don't have that luxury, right? We're in, you know, smaller, leaner um, organizations. Um, so we, you know, we, we monitor what, what's happening out there, but, you know, we don't have a whole, you know, suite of people dedicated to this. So, you know, it's important, as, as I'm sure all of you do, to actively participate in dialogue on your social media platforms. Um, you know, part of what you proactively choose to post is obviously with an eye toward what's going to be more engaging, what's going to start more dialogue. But, you know, sometimes you post content that may generate more conversation than you expected or takes the conversation in a less productive way than you expected. So all of this is about community management. So keeping, you know, developing the editorial calendar, um, you know, looking weeks and even months ahead where you're able to, to know what you're gonna post on a regular basis. You do have the ability, of course, um, to, to edit and delete when necessary. Um, deleting is something you certainly don't want to be in the habit of doing, um, but, you know, there, there certainly have been occasions where that was a reasonable solution. Um, and then, you know, we'll talk a little bit about social media policies, which are extremely important. Um, and in a social media policy, you know, that's where you can articulate standards of conduct um, that you can then pull through and, you know, make it a, a regular, you know, just make it a visible ongoing 
part of your social media community so that everybody understands, you know, when a line has been crossed, uh, well, you know, the standard had been set, everybody was aware of it. And so then at least your, in those cases where you do have to remove a member or, redu or remove content, you know, it's not coming completely out of left field. Um, so having, you know, those clear guidelines and standards, all of that is, is an important part of the community management. Next. Add a note here. Um, it is, um, you know, when you're, when you're managing the community, you need to understand how many participants you have um, and also be able to give the participants to elevate, to make, give their vote, the, give their voice the proper uh, strength that it should have. You know, a group with a thousand people, but with one person complaining all the time and posting time and time again, does not necessarily mean <laughs> that that represents a majority view of, of the group. It may very much only mean that person's own opinion or a couple of other people. One of the things that um, was challenging at the birth of the internet was from an organizer's point of view, a lot of times we looked at four or five posts thinking, okay, those people go out and get five or six people themselves to participate. That wasn't the case. So as I said, um, it really comes back to reputation. I mean, none, nothing that you do from a communication standpoint, um, you know, both from a proactive communication standpoint, um, both from, you know, as well as from the crisis communication and issues and manage, management standpoints, none of this happens or should happen in a vacuum. Um, really to maximize the value of what you say, when you say it, how you say it, to whom you say it, it all comes back to that reputation that you're trying to cultivate. The more positive a reputation have, you have, the better engaged you are with key stakeholders, uh, both within the church as well as outside the church, because let's face it, um, there are many benefits to be gained from having uh, strong relationships with other faiths, other churches, community leaders, you know, uh, just with the community, health fairs with the community, getting to know your neighbors, really actively and strategically and proactively cultivating that reputation and then grounding all of those communication efforts with the eye towards protecting that reputation, building that reputation. We've talked previously about this Goodwill Bank all of that is so vitally important and social media is part of that, not a part from that, if that makes sense. So sometimes, um, as, we, as I said, sometimes it's best not to engage on social media. Um, sometimes when we involve ourselves in particular conversations, um, that's not going to be a net benefit to our reputation. So we all know that there are controversial uh, discussions that take place on social media, uh, be it your own platform, be it other platforms on which you participate, but which your name or the name of your organization would be associated with, that you just don't want to go there because you don't want to bring, you don't want to give any helium, as they say, to a negative issue. So again, make sure your, your editorial calendar, your social media strategy is directly attuned with your brand and with the reputation that you want to cultivate, never ever forget that um, everything that you do put outline online, even if it's only for a few moments, a few minutes, um, somebody's gonna capture that and it absolutely can come back to haunt you. So as part of your social media uh, policy, you may even have sort of you know a fail safe, right? Where you may, before you push post, you may need a second or even a third set of eyes on that content, um, you know, just to make sure there are no sensitivities that you may have been unaware of, um, you know, before you put this out there into the permanent record, if you will. And just, you know, always, you can never go wrong by being too careful. And, um, you know, for example, when you get on the phone with a reporter, um, and Kevin knows this well, um, even if a conversation is ostensibly to be off the record, there's no guarantee. There's no, um, uh, there's nothing that says anything you say off the record doesn't end up on the record. And so it's important to use that care and precision with your social media postings as well. 
So taking a look at the, um, the life cycle of an issue in social media, um, it, it's posted instantaneously. Something happens, somebody has something to say, um, it's gonna go up and it's there and it is spreading and it is available for everybody to see and then it becomes viral. Uh, as it gets reposted, as people comment, as people take whatever was posted and put it on other social media platforms, um, it'll spread across all those platforms. A, a picture posted on Facebook may find itself on Instagram and may find itself on Snapchat, and then it may find some teenager posted it on TikTok. I mean, it, it will, it'll spread very quickly. And what happens is a critical mass forms. Uh, people start to coalesce around either an opinion, a picture, a like, or a dislike, and they start to move very quickly into having an opinion about any issue that has already be started to be moving across on uh, social media. Your response, proper and appropriate. Um, it, is, it is necessary to take a step back, as we love to say around here, take a breath and to realize what is going to actually correct the situation. Is this, could this die out by itself? Maybe, but we also have to analyze that. And to say, you know, what is it? If, if you know, for instance, you know, always wanna have the fight in the venue where it's being fought. Um, you know, so for instance, something is happening on Facebook and there's big discussion on it. You know, don't go to Twitter to, to answer or to enhance that conversation because then you're spreading it to another platform and that's not as necessarily helpful. So make sure it's going to the proper place and make sure the appropriateness of the response. And also remember, it lives online forever. And offline, people are gonna look at the number of clicks, gonna look at the numbers because the number of clicks can drive media coverage. You know, the media may see something that's getting a lot of interest on social media and then take it out of that platform and then put it on the evening news. And different issues you know, can be dealt on different plat. excuse me, dealt on different platforms. You know, Facebook is an ongoing conversation. You can invite, and you also have the ability to invite people to events. You can even raise money on, on Facebook. It has a built-in money raising system to it. Um, Twitter, that's the one that provides you a quick form to comment on breaking issues. Is something happened? Does something need to be communicated right away? Twitter is an opportunity to put, get something out there um, and get a statement released very quickly. And the media is, being, is very much attuned to following things on Twitter. You can also direct them to your Twitter feed. Instagram, it's going to look at you. Know, it's pictures and video. Is it, are they going to tell the story? So that's how we utilize Instagram to its best, best uses. LinkedIn, that's how you can reach the professional community. Um, it grows every day. More and more people have a LinkedIn account. And so you can track their, um, someone's professional growth over the years. Um, and you can have a link to be able to communicate to particular sections of people that are involved uh, in the professional lives um, of our country. And of, and of course, Kevin, on LinkedIn, there's a number of groups, just as, of course, there are on Facebook, but you might be more likely to find on LinkedIn, um, you know, groups consisting of business leaders in the community that you want to join and participate in and uh, form relationships with, that type of thing. Yeah, so how to prepare for manage unique needs of each platform. Know your message. As we talked in other seminars, if you understand what your message is, that makes this whole process so much easier. So, so know what your message is. What is the thing that describes uh, what you're trying to get across? You know, what is that message? Know your brand. What does your brand say about you? What do you want to say about your brand? And know that, that the brand needs to reflect your message. And then know your audience. Who do you want to reach and how do you want to reach them? different audiences, different social media platforms. Each of them has a different type of audience. And so figure out, okay, who are the people we're trying to reach and what are they using? Like we had the question earlier, what are your stakeholders following? So there may be times when, when you're not necessarily communicating a lot on say Instagram, but you know that you need to reach that younger demographic. So you're gonna make sure that you're posting on Instagram. And do your words concisely deliver your message you know, is this something that people can understand? Is it written in a way 
that is, is not too dense. It's pretty simple, but also written in a very tight way because, you know, for instance, on Twitter, you know, the initial tweet, uh, the initial posting is limited to 120 characters. 140, um, 140 yeah. So, so the, um, you know, but then how does the image convey your point? You know, sometimes a, a, a picture, as they say, a picture can, 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 you know, is worth a thousand words. And it can be very important that the simple picture or simple video, that can be able to prove your point and be able to motivate and persuade people to get them what they need. And then figure out, you know, which platform reaches your targeted audience. You know, you know if you're looking to reach, you know, women, women 50 plus, um, you know that Facebook is going to be the best ways to do that. If you want to reach the college market, um, you know that, or even the, the, the pre-college market, uh, for instance, you know, kids that are deciding where they're going to go to college, that Instagram may be your best opportunity in order to reach them with a targeted message that talks about your brand because you know the audience that you're trying to deliver it to. All right, next we're going to shift here and we're going to start talking about, um, oh, no, excuse me, excuse me, I jumped ahead here, slide. Oh, no, I didn't. I didn't. I'm fine. Um, do you have a social media platform? Um, I had a little policy. Phone. policy. Uh, do you have a social media policy? And, uh, and feel free to be honest here with a yes, no, or maybe um, <laughs> type answer. All right, as we count the votes. <clears throat> I do say through all this process, we've done much so. Uh, faster than Iowa did accounting votes earlier this year. <laughs> okay. Terrific. It is encouraging to see, and I appreciate the honesty of one person thinking maybe. Uh, the fact that, you know, 69% of you, of you, um, you know, do have a social media policy. The other 23, it's time to start thinking about a, um, a social media policy. But that is good that, um, that this is now an active part of, of your planning and what you're doing, that you do have a policy uh, in place. So well, let's dig in what, what, what can be and what should be um, in, a, um, in a social media policy. Okay, uh, just real quickly now, because we want to get into, uh, save a couple minutes for five minutes or so for Q&A. Um, you know, as, as we've sort of uh, touched on throughout the discussion today, social media policy is absolutely vital so that you don't find yourself at any point um, just sort of going on instinct and potentially making mistakes and or saying things that just sort of uh, contravene the sort of spirit and brand and reputation of your organization. So social media is right there. It's uh, one of the most accessible ways uh, for the public and your other stakeholders to access your organization. So again, having a strategy and an approach and a philosophy that sets out standards for conduct, that lays out in the community management um, portions of your policy that talks about when to engage on social media, how to engage with people, when does an issue rise to such a level that we do respond and when do we don't respond, all of that is contained within a social media policy. So set those guidelines and standards now and avoid problems later, much like with the overall need to plan to manage issues now and crisis communications now, and make sure that you have clear social media policies for internal and external uh, stakeholders. And you need to do a social media au uh, audit. You need to take a look at how, how your organization and how you are using social media. What platforms are being used? Which ones are being used and how you are using them? And these next couple of things may sound very tactical and, and, and um, surprising, but find out what the usernames and passwords are. Uh, I have more than once worked with a client where we're like, do you have a Twitter feed? Yes. Do you know the username and the password? No. Um, <laughs> have these accessible. Have someone that is in charge of making sure uh, that that information is available for everybody that needs it. Sometimes people may not need it. Um, make sure, you know, just make sure that you know who is, um, who has access, um, and then, you know, who approves and edits, edits content. Um, what needs to be addressed, how they use social media, what is the standard for posting, how will people behave, 
online and how people handle their social media, both professionally and personally. And then what content are you using in social media and how will you develop that content? Um, how to engage. Um, determine the level of actual engagement. Uh, figure out who is going to do that engagement. Um, pick which platform it should be. A Twitter storm should stay within Twitter. Figure out who your best messenger is. Who is the person that needs to be, just like in any other situation. Who can best explain this? Uh, and then deliver your message. And then um, what factors do you evaluate in formatting decisions and responses? Um, as I, I love to do alliterations, uh, and I'm doing so much alliterations as repeating a word over and over again. Is it the appropriate platform? Is it the appropriate message? Is it the appropriate audience? Many of you may have remembered this where United Airlines removed a passenger and people on board took a picture. And not in a picture, they took a video of this passenger being hauled off the plane where he had actually been struck and he was bleeding and he was a doctor and, and it was a chaotic situation. And then United goes on social media and apologizes for the inconvenience. Well, they should have been apologizing because social media quickly pointed out to them that no, your apology was not good. And the, the internet is a judgmental place. And because they decided to apologize for an inconvenience as opposed to the actual situation, United lost millions of dollars in that situation. So we're going to open up the floor here uh, for a Q&A. Um, and I appreciate the, uh, the time and, and uh, that you've given us today. Thank you so much, uh, Greg and Kevin. Uh, really interesting information today. Um, I think some of our, our organizations have probably had uh, some varying levels of, of experience with, with what we were talking about today, but it's really helpful to have some structure around that and uh, appreciate, appreciate your comments there. Uh, so folks, if you do have a question for us, uh, go ahead and use the Zoom question and answer feature. Um, and again, I just wanted to re-highlight some of the resources um, that we have available for those uh, dealing with especially our current issue of uh, probably I'd, I'd call it the issue of the day but it may it may take a little bit longer than that um, oh here's a, here's an interesting question should organizations pause our regular social media plan when situations like COVID-19 arise so you have a regular strategy and then uh, you know, a, a really large, you know, event takes place. And uh, how do you respond or react to that kind of thing? Um, this is the biggest advantage um, um, of, of social media and the information superhighway and the internet. Um, I mean, I, you know, the, the world is going to be living on social media here for the next few weeks. Um, it is important to to, 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 you don't necessarily pause what you're regularly doing, but you need to enhance your response. You need to make sure that you're communicating to everybody quickly, accurately, um, and answering all their questions. And then, then you also gonna have to be a little redundant and remind people and be able to, and also update things. You know, because the internet's things stay there forever, one of the things that you definitely wanna do is you want to make sure that you are updating information and they don't know information, it get, gets stale. Right, and so, just to, oh, sorry, Dave, just, just to quickly add to that. So I think um, it's, you know, you certainly don't want to appear insensitive, I think is probably what underpinned that question uh, by sort of going on with, you know, perhaps more mundane postings. But, you know, to Kevin's point, I think you can generally, um, keep your sort of regular schedule, but it's also helpful to, to flag one place that people can come for regular updates on an issue such as COVID-19. And I, I will say, you know, what, what Adventist Risk Management has done, there's a pop-up as soon as you go to the to their, their, their web page, which, which directs you to where there's information. And, uh, you know, I, I was very impressed when I saw that pop-up when I first signed into the web page this week. 
appreciate that those answers those comments I, I, my takeaway is it's important to be relevant and responsive but now is not the time to cut corners either um, with with due, some due process to retain that accuracy and um, that's important too. Mm -hmm. Uh, really great question. Next, uh, is there a sample policy? You know, talking about the social mm -hmm. media policy, mm -hmm. how does how does one build that? A sample is often helpful. Uh, yeah, I would say uh, so. On the next and closing slide, um, we can uh, if we can advance to that. But Kevin and I have our email addresses there, and anyone interested in um, a sample social media policy uh, should email us, and we'll be happy to follow up. Very good. Absolutely. That kind of policy, it, it's great to start from a sample, but then you're going to want to do some some work to, to refine Absolutely. it for your organization. Custom, right. Customize it, all of that. Yeah. So that's a good approach. Well, thank you both, uh, Greg and Kevin, for your work preparing this information material for us and being available for uh, sharing those kinds of resources like, like the sample policy and taking your time and thank you to everybody who joined us today for spending some time with us on this important topic. Um, we, we look forward to uh, the next, the next webinar in our series and we'll be reaching out with uh, more information about that uh, in the, in the coming weeks and months. So thank you for taking the time and uh, be safe everyone and uh, take care, especially in, in these heightened times of awareness regarding COVID-19. Terrific. Take care, everybody. Thank you.